Hello, my name is Jacques, and today we're going to continue learning the basics of the Bevy game engine. Bevy is a simple data-driven game engine built in Rust. It's free and open source. This tutorial is the sixth episode in my Learn Bevy 0.10 video series. This episode builds on what we learned in the previous episodes. Today, we're going to be continuing with our Bevy ball game project that we've been working on. In today's episode, we're going to be increasing the challenge of our game by spawning in more enemies over time. This really starts to make things fun and interesting and adds replayability to get a high score. Next, we'll look at Bevy events to exit out of the game. We'll also see how to make our own events when it's game over. We'll see how to send and receive our own game over events. Let's hop back to our code and get started. Spawning enemies over time is going to be very similar to how we spawn stars over time, and I'm going to leave this as an exercise to the viewer to try to implement themselves. You're going to need another public constant, another resource to hold a timer, you're going to need to tick the timer, and then you're going to need to create a system to spawn in enemies over time when the timer finishes. Try to implement this yourself, and then come back and see if you did it the same way I did. Let's get started by adding our public constant at the top of our file. We'll call it enemy spawn time, and we'll set it to five for five seconds. Next, we're gonna need to create a resource. Let's go down here below our star spawn timer resource. Let's create one called enemy spawn timer. Let's derive resource to tell Bevy that this is a resource. Inside our resource, we wanna create a timer. We'll just call it timer and use the bevy timer type. Now let's implement default for the enemy spawn timer, just like we did for the star spawn timer. This code is gonna be identical, but using the enemy spawn time public constant we created. We create the implement default for enemy spawn timer block. We need to fulfill the default method to return an enemy spawn timer with its initial value set. And we do this by creating an enemy spawn timer and passing in our enemy spawn time constant. This is also gonna be repeating. Now we need to add this resource to our app. Let's go back to the top of our file. Here below the star spawn timer, we'll add in our enemy spawn timer. Now that it's added, just like the star spawn timer, we need to tick this timer. Let's go to the bottom of our file and let's add the tick enemy spawn timer system here. For our first system parameter, we're going to need the enemy spawn timer resource we created. We're going to need this to be a mutable resource because we need to update the timer. For the second system parameter, we're going to need the time resource. Remember that's provided by Bevy. And now in the body of our system, we simply call enemy spawn timer. We get the timer and we call the tick method, passing in time.delta, which is the time since the last frame. Don't forget to register this system with our app. We want this to run once per frame, so we use add system. And now that we've got a timer and it's ticking, we just need to create a system to spawn in our enemies using the timer. Let's go to the bottom of our file. Let's create a system called spawn enemies over time. For the first system parameter, we're going to need commands to spawn in an entity with the enemy component and a sprite bundle. Next, we're going to need a window query to get our window width and height. The asset server resource to load in a PNG file for our texture. And then lastly, the enemy spawn timer to see if the timer is finished ticking. Notice this isn't mutable, we're just reading the value. Let's start by checking if our timer is finished ticking. If it has, we can go ahead. First, we want to get the window. Next, we want to get a random X and Y value. And then finally, we want to call commands.spawn. We pass in a sprite bundle with our red ball and the enemy component. And just like before, when we set up our enemies, we need to set the direction variable on the enemy component. And we just set this to be a random X and Y value in a VEC2 that we normalize. Don't forget, we need to register this system in our app. We want this system to run once per frame, so we use add system. And now we've got enemies spawning over time. Let's cargo run our app and check it out. And look at that, an enemy just spawned in. Another one. I'm 
getting quite a few now. It's actually becoming a challenge to dodge them. And our stars keep spawning in. Oh, and I lost. Let's see if you can beat 56. Next, we're going to look at using events to exit the game when we hit the escape button so that we don't have to go back to our terminal and hit control C. To do this, we're going to use an event provided by Bevy called the app exit event. First, at the top of our file, we're going to add the following use statement to get the app exit event. Next, let's go to the bottom of our file and we're going to create a system called exit game. For our first system parameter here, we're going to want to get keyboard input. So as we've seen before with the player movement system, we get the input resource of type key code to get keyboard input. And for our second system parameter, we're going to want an event writer of type app exit. Notice this has to be mutable. We start by checking if the escape key has been pressed. And if it has, we want to send an app exit event. We call the send method on our event writer and send in the app exit event. This is consumed by Bevy to exit our application. Don't forget to register the system with our app. We want the system to run once per frame. Let's cargo run our application now and test it out. Now if you hit escape, you'll exit the application. This brings us to a new concept, Bevy events. Events are used to send data between systems. Events are just Rust structs. They can be empty or they can contain data. We send events using an event writer and we receive events using an event reader. Notice that the app exit event that we used didn't hold any data. Just like with resources and components, Bevy provides events for us to use, like the app exit event we used, but we can also make our own. We'll make our own event in just a moment. Unlike components and resources, we don't need to use a derived macro to declare a Rust struct as an event, but we do need to register these types that we want to use as events with our app. We'll see this in a moment as well. Let's say we've created a game over event. System A can send out that event using an event writer of type game over. One or more other systems, let's say B, C, D, etc., can read that event using an event reader of type game over. Depending on how your systems are run, you can either have one of the following behaviors. When system A runs before system B, system A sends an event, system B receives the event in the same frame. When system B runs before system A, system A sends an event, system B receives the event in the following frame. Events only exist from the time they are sent in a frame to the end of the next frame. We'll take a look at explicit system ordering in the future to see how we can influence the order our systems are run in. But just keep in mind for that second case, you're never going to lose an event. It might just be a frame late. Let's hop back to our code and create a game over event. Let's scroll down. Right here below our resources, but before we start our systems, let's just write it here. We'll call this event game over. And inside it, we'll give it a score variable of type U32 to send out the final score we achieved. Let's scroll back up to our app. And here, after we insert our resources, we're gonna write add event, turbofish syntax, pass in the type game over, and finish it with parentheses. This tells our app that this game over struct is going to be an event. Now let's go down to our enemy hit player system. Inside this system, if the player is hit by an enemy, we want to send out our game over event and our final score. First, let's add in our event writer of type game over. There it is. Notice it's mutable. And lastly, we are also going to need our score resource. This is to get our final score that we achieved. 
A note on how I order my system parameters, and this is just my preference. I do it in alphabetical order of the types. So commands, C, then events, E, queries, Q, resources, R. Just personal preference, but it keeps things neat. Inside our if distance check block, as the final step, let's send out a game over event. We use our event writer. We call the send method as we've seen before. Pass in a game over event, but this time it holds data, so we're gonna need to construct it. And it's got a score variable. What do we want this to be? Well, we're gonna pull from our score resource. So we'll say score.value. Don't forget to end your send method with a semicolon. Save to format, and there we have it. We're sending out a game over event. Now to test that we're sending out this event and we're able to receive it, let's create a temporary system called detect game over. I changed my mind. I want to call it handle game over. And for the system parameter, we want an event reader of type game over. Notice again, Regardless of if we're using an event reader or a writer, we need to make it mutable. In our system body, now to read events. Similar to queries, we need to iterate over any events that this event reader is holding. So we say for event in game over event reader dot iter. And now we can handle the events. The reason we iterate here and that the reader can hold multiple events is because multiple systems can send the same event type. In this case though, we know it's just gonna be one, but we'll stick with the iterate pattern in case there's anything else that can end the game in the future. Let's simply just print out the final score. We're gonna call toString to turn this into a string since it's a U32. And then finally, just finish that with a semicolon. Now we do need to register our handle game over system with our app. Let's do that now. We want this to run once per frame, so we say add system. Let's cargo run our application now. Let's get some points quickly. And there we go, I died. You can see that event got sent out and we received it. Your final score is six. To illustrate that we can receive events to multiple systems, I'm going to start by first creating another resource called high scores to keep track of multiple scores. Let's scroll down. And here, right below our score resource, we'll add a high score resource. Inside of the high scores, we'll create a scores variable of type vec, of type tuple, holding a string and a U32. The idea is the player's name and their score. Don't forget to derive resource. And we need to implement default for high scores. We need to implement the default method. We need to return a new instance of high scores. Here we set scores to be an empty vec. You can see it's a new vec that's just empty. Let's go back to our app. After we insert the score resource, let's insert the high score resource. Turbofish syntax, high scores. Now let's go to the bottom of our file. Let's create a new system called update high scores. First, just like our handle game over system, for our first system parameter, we want an event reader of type game over. And for our second system parameter, we're gonna want the high score resource. It's gonna be mutable. So we use resmut high scores. Now in the body of our system, just like before, we iterate on the game over events. We say high scores, 
scores push method, a tuple, let's just say player for now, and the event dot score semicolon. Oh, here we have a type mismatch. We passed in a string slice, but it wants a string. So we just call to string and it's happy. Don't forget to register the system with our app. We use add system. And then finally, just to verify that the high scores are getting updated, let's make one more system. Let's call it high scores updated. And here for our first and only system parameter, we just want to look at the high scores resource. It doesn't need to be mutable. Let's see if it's changed. Remember, we can call the isChanged method on a resource to see if it's been changed since the last time the system ran. Oh, I forgot my if here. Now, if the high scores got changed, we just want to print them all out. We can do this by calling println high scores and passing high scores as the argument. Notice here we're using a colon question mark to print out high scores. This is used to debug things, but to do this we need to derive the debug trait on our high scores struct. Let's go back up to high scores. Derive debug after resource. Back down to our system. This looks good now. Let's register this with our app. That's registered. Now let's cargo run. And there we go. We can see that the high scores got printed out, showing that both the handle game over system and the update high score system both received the same game over event. That's the end of episode six. We've covered more examples of timers to spawn in enemies over time and add more of a challenge to our game, as well as replayability. We looked at using events, both bevy provided events and creating our own to send and receive. Still to come, we'll take a look at states in order to reset our game so we can restart and continue playing to try to beat our high scores. We'll also take a look at fixed timestamps, UI, and many more examples. Thank you all for watching. Please let me know if you have any questions down in the comments and I appreciate all your feedback. Have a great day and thank you very much for watching.